Bob Schmidt, the uh, co-president of ITP. Uh, Pat Lewis, who is also co-president, uh, sends her best. Her aunt is dying, so she is uh, with her tonight. We wanted to uh, send her best to all of you. And Andy, your son, is way there in the back making sure that this goes down for all posterity. Uh, one thing I've asked is, uh, if you have one of these, uh, would you turn it off so that uh, there is not ringing? There is not ringing during the uh, during tonight's event. Uh, ITP, as I think hopefully most of you really recognize, uh, is a treasure chest. Uh, there are wonderful jewels here. Faculty, students, people who are really, uh, in each in their own way, really contributing to making the world a place that is more full of peace and love and is more awake. And uh, tonight, uh, we're delighted to celebrate and to learn from Charlie Tart, who is one of our very special jewels at the school, uh, a man who has contributed to the field of transpersonal psychology for decades and decades, whose research and publications have really made a difference in the areas of consciousness studies, mindfulness, other ways of knowing. Uh, we're delighted to have Charlie on the faculty, and we are uh, committed to continuing the work he's doing forever and ever. So one of the things we're gearing up for, and that someday we're, soon we're going to publicly announce, is a uh, a capital campaign, and one of the things we're going for is an endowed chair in Charlie's name for consciousness studies that, that can continue his work. <laughs> so it is a delight to introduce Charlie Tart. Some of you may have seen this when I was using it as a focus slide earlier. It's, uh, it, can, it can be seen as something of a theme of the talk in certain ways this evening. Partly because I'm going to apologize in advance because this won't be the usual kind of smooth, finished kind of talk I like to do where I think I've got all the answers. I'm really preferring to share what is some of the cutting edge of thinking about this area for me in order to get a good discussion going at the end. So that may mean a little jumps here and there rather than putting it all together as if I knew the answer. But really, I'm a dummy. I don't know the answers on this. Since some of you may not find this inspiring enough to talk about or to open a talk on meditation, I thought I'd give you a Tibetan dedication instead from the classical texts that goes, Ho, oh, mesmerized by the sheer variety of perceptions, which are like the illusory reflections of the moon and water. Beings wander endlessly astray in samsara's vicious cycle. In order that they may find comfort and ease in the luminosity and all-pervading space, the true nature of their own minds, I generate the immeasurable love, joy, compassion, and equanimity of the awakened mind, the heart of Bodhicitta. It's much more high-toned than the Buddha, or than the, the dummy's book. Uh, it sounds straightforward enough, and it's very much my wish for the consequences of all our actions, although there is a part of me that says, those sentiments are fine, but how do you do that? If I could have the next slide, please, to contrast or to say something more about this Meditation for Dummies book. It's actually a very good book, full of excellent wisdom, okay? You probably can't read the <laughs> caption on this. Can, can you see the cartoon? Guy teaching the lady meditation, he's saying, okay, your posture is very good. Now relax, concentrate, and slowly let go of your cell phone. <laughs> Important advice for this modern age. So this lecture is for dummies of a sort. And the first definition of dummies is the old classical saying that a very wise person is someone who knows how little they know. I rather like that definition because it makes me feel very wise but I would rather actually know some things than just be aware of my ignorance. But we are dummies in approaching meditation, beginners in a sense, because while we know a lot and share a lot, we don't know that much and there's important gaps in our knowledge. We all think meditation's important, or I don't think we'd be here tonight. Probably everyone here has some kind of personal meditation practice or experiences that have come from meditation. 
I'm sure everyone here has sometimes been confused as to what are people talking about when they talk about meditation, and perhaps even confused when you've been talking about it at times. I certainly have been. So we'd all like to understand what meditation is and be able to apply it better. And we all may suspect that there's some sense in which meditation is not very efficient, a theme I'm going to come back to several times. We want to become smarties rather than dummies with respect to meditation. So let me start that process in a way by leaving you with a question. Has there been any progress in the meditation field in the last few hundred years? Interesting thing to sit in there. So I'll try to make some ideas about meditation a little clearer, but I stress this is very much a reflections in progress, and I'm looking forward to the discussion at the end. Now coming back to this question, has there been any progress? It's a funny question to ask if you think about it. Almost all other fields of human endeavor we can think about, maybe with the exception of politics or something like that, we can say there's been progress. You know, medicine has progressed, chemistry has progressed, transportation has progressed. I've never heard anyone talk about progress in the meditation field. I've never heard anyone say, we teach it better and it works better for people now than they did 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Now, there's a mythology that usually goes with meditation that supports that. The mythology, which you can find in practically all traditions, is that long ago there were these perfect teachers and perfect students, and now you got us. So what do you expect in a degenerate age like this? Well, that might be true, or it might be false, but whether it's true or false, I suspect that kind of myth is a major obstacle to pro progress. Because if you think all the best stuff was a long time ago, you're not inclined to experiment. You're not inclined to try anything new. If all those teachers in the past were perfect, then all you want to do is emulate those teachers. You don't want to mess up and not do anything they didn't do. Now, maybe it's just because I'm a Westerner, but I am a Westerner, damn it, and I'm all for progress. I'd like to see some progress in this field. So, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. Uh, students who've worked with me on their dissertations you can put the next slide up, please, Cindy. Know that I'm constantly making them rewrite their dissertations because you get totally lost in technical details. And I keep reminding them, you want to remember what the woods are and not get lost in the trees. So this is a quick outline that I'm sure nobody can read beyond about six or seven rows back about what I'm going to You can read it back there? Oh, that's amazing. How, who else can read it that far back? OK. I made an assumption that was wrong, but you know what they say about the word assume? It makes an ass of you and me, or at least of me in this particular case. So to outline what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about difficulties with the very word meditation. I'll then make some working distinctions between three basic types of meditation practice. Uh, then I'm going to talk about my personal experience with meditation, my strengths and weaknesses, partly to let you know what biases I might bring to this and partly because it illustrates some of the problems we face. And then I'm going to get into the heart of the matter, a, look, a basic look at the human mind and how we live in samsara, in a state of illusion, and meditation as a technique to try to get us out of that particular state. From that I'll talk about meditation as controlled attention practices, and then I will talk about some possible progress, the work of my friend Shinzen Young, who I think has come up with some new things that are important. And so I'll elaborate on insight meditation as psycho-spiritual purification for both the reduction of suffering and the increase of satisfaction in life. I might give some more examples of Shinzen's work, but I'll probably skip it for lack of time. And then, since I'm a scholar, I'll end up calling for more research, of course. You knew that was coming, about how we can improve possible meditation practice, how we can begin to make some kind of practice. I'll show you this, uh, this summary again at the end, and we'll see whether we've gotten anywhere.